Welcome everybody. This is uh, the If Cyber seminar series and uh, we have a very distinguished speaker today. Um, the title is Capture Avoidance by Client Side T Integration. And the speaker is Professor Gene Sudik. He is a distinguished professor of computer science at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, he was also at IBM Zurich uh, in 90s and then USC and ISI. He's a fellow of ACM, IEEE, and some other institutions. He was also an editor of the ACM Tops, also used to be called TISEC, and has been uh, the, the recipient of 2017 ACM SIGSAC Outstanding Contribution Award and 2020 IFIP Jean-Claude Lapeer Awards. So I guess there is a lot more to say about his profile. Uh, he's a highly cited researcher and also a good friend of Australia and UNSW. So welcome, Jane, and I will hand over the floor to you. Uh, to everyone else, like Q&A box is there. So at the end of uh, his talk, we'll take questions and I'll relate to Jane and he will try to answer and maybe we can facilitate some conversations as well. So over to you, Jane. Good morning. Thank you very much, Sanjay, for having me. And um, yeah, uh, we'll make do under the circumstances or I'd much rather be uh, in uh, beautiful Sydney or somewhere else in Australia giving this talk in person. Um, and thank you for abbreviating my bio because it's always long, you know, long and boring when people read the whole thing. Um, let me share my uh, screen here. Um, so at this point, I assume everybody sees my PowerPoint screen. Okay. So um, here we have it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to try to keep to a reasonable time and I'm knowing that attention tends to wane quickly after like what 40, 45 minutes, at least studies show. Um, so this is a work that we did at UCI in collaboration with uh, a colleague um, at uh, Microsoft Research Cambridge, Andrew Pavard. Um, and uh, there are two of my uh, PhD students, Yoshimichi Nakatsuka and Urchin Ostert, who were also uh, very much involved in this work. And this just appeared last week um, at uh, Usenix Security Conference 2021. And as you see, the title is Cacti. And of course, pardon the tortured um, abbreviation. If you are in computer science research for any length of time, you get used to these kinds of very contortionist abbreviations. <clears throat> So this is capture avoidance with client side T integration. And just a, quickly a couple of words. So uh, the home of the UCI authors of this work is Sprout, and that's my uh, kind of a research group, a lab. And uh, if you go there, you can uh, see maybe not all that up to date, but sort of the idea, you get the idea of the kind of landscape that we cover uh, in security, privacy, crypto, applied cryptography. Uh, it's not like one focus, but there's a lot of different uh, uh, sort of research efforts in uh, all kinds of directions, but all under the general umbrella of security and privacy. Enough said. Um, so, uh, yeah, things we all um, know and love. Uh, things we often, and some of us more often than others, uh, get confronted with are sort of like this. Looking at this beautiful... Uh, sort of tableau and it being asked to uh, select all squares with traffic lights. Now, as you stare at this, and if you can see it, I mean, assuming you can see it clearly, uh, and I don't mean in this, in this slide, but in general, when you're confronted with it, if you can see it clearly, which sometimes is not the case, uh, you might have the following question. So there is a square here with one part of the traffic light, and then there's another square with another part of the traffic light, and then there's a square above it, which has a street light, but also a piece of the traffic light, a very small one. Also, the traffic light uh, is uh, supported by a, by a pole, right? And the pole is not clear whether the, the, the actual pole is a traffic light or not. And maybe if you are sort of slightly sight impaired, you might not notice that there is a traffic light here in the last uh, column in the second row. Uh, that looks like it's uh, sort of faintly red. And so the chances are not at all negligible that you will not answer this or solve this capture correctly. 
And of course, you can skip it and get presented with another capture, or you can just give it all up and forget going to the, that website or doing whatever it is that you wanted to do, which of course happens. So what are captures? Well, they are, as uh, most people who've been around since uh, early 2000s uh, know, uh, basically another tortured acronym and even more tortured than cacti, is a completely automated public Turing test to tell computers and humans apart. Essentially referring to um, tasks, uh, usually visual tasks, uh, that are relatively easy, uh, natural for humans to, uh, to solve, but um, are computationally difficult for machines or for algorithms uh, to do. So they've been around since uh, quite a long time, uh, already 18 years or so, since uh, a, um, a seminal paper by um, uh, Louis Fanon and... Um, I think it was Fanon and uh, Blom and um, somebody else that had this paper TuraCrypt 2003 and it made quite a lot of uh, noise and it was became not instantly but it quickly became popular and uh, not for any uh, nefarious reasons it was it had a good reason to be popular because at the time spam and uh, all kinds of nefarious uh, activities uh, were burgeoning and there was definitely is, and still is a need to stem those uh, activities. It was originally aimed to prove uh, that the person uh, on the other hand is actually human, right? So um, back in the early days, just an aside, back in the early days of the internet in the late early 80s, sorry, in the late 80s and early 90s, there was this uh, kind of saying going around that, that on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, point in around 2003, it was clear that on the internet, nobody knows you're a bot. So uh, this was, captures were sort of a timely tool uh, to allow someone to prove that uh, they're actually human and uh, also to assist in some useful task. And this is probably, uh, well, arguably could be the greatest claim to fame of captures, not so much that they approve that you're, you're human, but in the process of proving that you're human, you're actually showing that uh, you're actually doing something useful. And this certainly uh, appeals to uh, the charitable nature of a lot of us. And so looking at uh, this um, uh, capture here, what is it, what is, what's useful about uh, the activity of uh, selecting all squares with traffic lights? Well, um, it's supposed to actually uh, help in labeling photos, right? So you have a bunch of stock photos or uh, uh, scanned uh, photos and um, it's in, in, in they're stored in some giant database, uh, some library, and it's nice to know what is in that photo. And so machines can recognize certain shapes but only primitive shapes and not so well. And uh, sometimes there's like error, large error probabilities. And so it helps to have a human look and um, uh, tell you that there's a traffic light in this picture, or there is a, I don't know, a, a Volvo station wagon in this picture, or something like that, or a fire hydrant. So labeling photos with keywords that appear in the photo is a useful thing. Right, so again, so things like parsing text, not just labeling photos, but uh, parsing uh, text that was not recognizable by, say, a state-of-the-art uh, optical character recognition means. Um, now, uh, another quote, I forget who, who said this, it captures uh, torturing or at least deeply annoying billions of innocent users since 2004. This is trying to parallel a McDonald's slogan of like uh, feeding billions of people since God knows when. Uh, anyway, um, what are the common use cases of captures? Um, well, typically they're protecting some kind of access to high demand items like um, event ticket sales. So you have a concert by a popular rap star and um, you don't want ticket scalpers or bots to be able to grab any significant number of tickets uh, to resell or to whatever, for whatever reason. So for concerts, uh, again, games, uh, sporting events, um, this would be, this is very uh, particularly useful. Um, 
in the United States, probably in Australia as well, national park reservations, these tend to, or hiking trail permits, uh, these tend to come up, um, let's say, on a certain uh, date, like typically like three months ahead there. It's like you want to go to Yosemite National Park, uh, hike a particular trail, you need to be up at 6 a.m. on a specific date in order to grab or to, to have a chance to grab a, a pass or a ticket. So um, it's useful to be able to protect against uh, automated means of doing, of grabbing those. Also certain high value events like um, signing up for a new account, right? So setting up for a Gmail account, a Yahoo account, or any kind of a, a new email account or account on a website, let's say with an airline or a hotel, um, that's something that uh, involves sort of an asymmetric amount of work, meaning that uh, the website needs to perform some non-trivial amount of computation, allocate some resources. And so in order to, to do that, it wants to know that there is a real human behind the creation of an account. Similarly, various types of online polls, um, elections, surveys, want to make sure that you are human. And uh, again, tend to use captures. But even the more mundane activities like sending emails to mailing lists sometimes get uh, uh, protected, some protection from captures or performing, let's say you go to a large website of a bank uh, or a government agency and somewhere in the corner of, of the web page, there is a search box, right? So you enter some nonsense in there and you hit search. And now what are you asking the web server to do is um, perform an operation that is uh, fairly time consuming. Uh, even if the, everything is indexed on that website, it's a fairly time consuming resource, uh, heavy operation. And so uh, a capture can pop up at that in that case. There are quite a few different types of captures and I, I, I don't try to be exhaustive here. Um, text captures are have been the first kind that uh, popped up in like early 2000s. Uh, things, a variation of this you see here um, at the top of the, of the slide, uh, there is some kind of a distorted, contorted text and uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, possible for perhaps by, by a machine algorithm to determine um, reliably what this is. It might actually determine, but there may be two or three variations that it's not sure which one is correct. And so after some number, large number of people solve the same capture, it's possible to kind of, with a higher confidence, determine which is the likely um, text that appears in this picture. So here we have overlooks and inquiry, and this is an easy example. Um, then we have the, the lovely uh, picture labeling thing where you have a fire hydrant um, or you're being asked to identify a fire hydrant here um, in, in these vignettes, these sort of separate photos. And uh, some of them are clear, some of them may be less so. Like, for example, uh, um, you know, there, well, actually, this one is not too bad. There's two, there's three higher fire hydrants, I think. Um, and then, of course, there's the everybody favorite uh, current, like uh, the recapture uh, type or that Google runs, which you just click it usually serves as a kind of a gateway into other captures. So you, 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 you click, I'm not a robot. And if you're lucky, that's it. And if you're having a bad day, then you might be presented with a textual or a pictorial capture or some variation thereof. Now, um, as I said before, some of these are trying to do something useful like label photos or parse difficult to recognize, optically recognize text especially from um, damaged or old books or documents and things like that. Um, and captures, uh, particular recaptures here can be used uh, from within a HTML, uh, from a, within, a, within a script and you see, we just insert some code and you can activate um, a recapture from within your website. If you're running a web server, there are others, there are some recaptures or some captures that are popular in, um, certain parts of the world, like in China and Japan, there are some, some, some methods that I'm not showing here, but they usually involve like rotating something in, a, in the right position or sliding something to the right place. Um, 
but the same idea is that is uh, they are probably not serving any useful purpose beyond uh, just proving that you're human, but they still kind of ask you to perform a task that presumably uh, only a human could perform well. So um, the downsides of captures are not surprising. Um, I don't think anybody is going to find what I say here uh, any kind of revelation. Um, Okay, here, so here is actually a, a, a nice example here at the top. You see the, the you type, you're supposed to type the text that says arch, and then it says something that is just difficult and really challenging to kind of uh, unambiguously parse, even, even for a human. Um, they are clearly often uh, annoying and, uh, and just difficult. And because of that, they are time consuming. And um, they essentially result in uh, lost productivity. You know, not, most of us do not create accounts every day, but we do go to various websites, uh, often for work. And when presented with captures and uh, sometimes multiple ones, because if you don't solve one correctly, uh, then you ask to solve more, uh, this can translate into quite a big loss of productivity and uh, essentially lost revenue. Um, um, or at least lost fund funding. Um, there have been studies that uh, back in 2010, uh, Burstein uh, and, 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 and co-authors looked how good the humans at solving captures and evaluated, uh, performed a large scale evaluation that showed that uh, it's quite dubious to say that captures are actually good for you. And then there was a study uh, at CHI 2011, there was a study on the, of, user unfriendliness of current captures or current at the time and the uh, motivation for more user-friendly ones. Uh, it uh, is very clear that uh, captures as a concept they cannot be used just, just like a, on any device. So it's difficult to use captures on resource constrained devices like smartphones. That's why we tend not to see them as often there because they require, uh, I guess, the real estate to be displayed uh, sufficiently uh, legibly, and they require um, sufficient resolution, light, uh, right? Because if it's if the screen is small and it's dark, then it's very difficult to see to solve a capture. They're also not very um, appropriate for people who are uh, sight or um, just visually impaired. Um, there are of course audio captures, and there. I, I will just avoid those because I don't actually know very much about them. Uh, that's their own world. Um, the problem with audio captures, of course, that also they require uh, sufficiently good hearing on the part of the user. They require uh, absence of ambient noise. And uh, yeah, and of course, they also require some linguistic competency, right? So if you have to sort of use appropriate language when dealing with, a, with a certain users, um, with the particular users, and of course, um, last but not least, there are privacy concerns, right? So in particular with recapture, uh, which um, this is the, I am not a robot, uh, you know, click, click here, show that you're not a robot. Uh, this whole notion of recaptures as pioneered by Google is really um, based on monitoring user behavior. And so uh, there have been quite a few privacy concerned with that because the other captures that are sort of standalone and just pop up one at a time, uh, they don't really monitor or uh, keep histories of user behavior, whereas recapture, this recapture does. And so there have been some um, causes for concern in particular recently, uh, the dark side of cab recaptures that was um, evaluated by Fast Company, and then there's a Cloudflare pub publication uh, more recently that uh, motivates moving from recapture to edge capture, which, of course, Cloudflare tries to promote. Um, anyway, moving right along, and we all then know the downsides. Also, uh, recaptures and captures can be subverted. Um, so, um, how, well, they can, some of them can be subverted, uh, by machines or by machine learning algorithms. And, uh, as, um, we've seen with the explosion of, uh, machine learning, uh, methods and, uh, advances in that, in the ML technology, um, 
it's not surprising that machine learning techniques can aid in solving uh, captures um, automatically. So this started back in 2008, where um, CIRA captures were shown to be solvable by machines by uh, by Golay, and then continues up to now with uh, recent work on uh, hacking Google recaptures version three with the reinforcement learning. And this is not again an exhaustive list. I'm sure things are popping up all the time because a popular both ML and CAPTCHA is a popular area of research. Now, not to be outdone, of course, on the side of um, fortifying CAPTCHAs, there have been proposals for ma uh, machine learning resistant techniques. And uh, you see here a couple of examples. Uh, unfortunately, as far as I know, um, none of the proposed techniques that are sort of machine learning resistant or claim to be machine learning resistance are provably so. That is, uh, and it's probably difficult to be to be fair to achieve any kind of provably uh, provable resistance to machine learning. So another way to subvert captures is of course to use humans. Uh, now, um, one typical way to do so is, you see here we have a target website and the target websites present, you see the red arrow capture to someone who in this case is not a human, but a bot uh, that is trying, let's say, create an account. Well, the bot uh, forwards uh, the capture request very quickly to a colluding website and it's some kind of a uh, capture farm operator who then, um, and now this picture is a little is a little misleading. It says it, pre it it presents the capture to unsuspecting user. Well, this is not always an unsuspecting user. So, for example, one um, particular case that I'm familiar with, where there was a there was a pretty uh, popular porn site. This is like five seven years ago that was free, but uh, in order to gain access to its content, it was asking users to solve captures. So this would be an unsuspecting user. So you see here, the bot is essentially farming out to a uh, the porn site and the porn site is asking its users to solve captures that are then forwarded back to, the, to that porn website operator who then forwards it to the bot and then the bot uh, feeds it to the target or victim website. Now, is this... Um, can this be done quickly? Of course, it can be done very quickly because the the, the uh, extra transmission delays between the bot and colluding website and colluding site and, and this user are negligible. This is the internet after all. So, um, but it's not always, an, not always an unsuspecting user because sometimes these are just like uh, capture farms, right? So uh, this colluding website here could be just a capture farm operator. Uh, and uh, in many countries, or at least a handful of countries in the world, uh, are well known for hosting uh, large capture farms. And these are staffed by people who are either desperate and uh, have no other employment, so you can't really blame them, uh, or people just have nothing to do and uh, just want some entertainment, if you can call captures entertainment. And recent prices are something between uh, uh, five cents, uh, um, sorry, to the, the 50 cents to a dollar for a thousand captures or something around three dollars worth for a thousand recaptures. Those are a little more difficult um, or more challenging, but still, still fairly cheap uh, considering that uh, every capture solving um, may lead to say an account creation, which then gives uh, some nefarious uh, creature a, um, or an organization uh, a means to uh, all kinds of uh, interesting activities. Right, so, but then the question is, uh, since this is a um, human-based uh, subversion of captures, is this really an attack? I mean, uh, in some ways this can be viewed as uh, business as usual. Captures are being solved by humans and they are supposed to, supposed to be solved by humans. They're just not solved by humans for whom they're intended. Um, so it's more of a philosophical point. The bottom line is that captures are still popular and uh, quite widely used. So recent uh, six or so months ago, um, it was reported that ReCapture has uh, well over 6 million live sites and ReCapture version three, uh, close to 2 million live sites. Now, what does it mean? So it means that the, these are websites, web servers that use these capture techniques and then present them to us, the users. 
uh, we are not going to hear in this work that I'm describing, we're not going to be a sort of iconoclastic and say, oh, cap down with captures, let's get rid of them, they're useless, and that's not true. We believe that captures are generally still quite um, useful in, in terms of uh, increasing, not preventing attacks, uh, not preventing, let's say, spurious account creation or uh, grabbing um, hard to come by tickets and things like that. But um, it is still a barrier, um, a, a certain bar that the attacker has to sub, uh, uh, jump over. And this sort of reduces the rates of malicious activities. Now, it would be nice, and this is just a kind of a random, some random wish here. It would be nice if there was an, a study, a, a thorough, uh, serious scientific study by competent economists evaluating whether over the last uh, 18 or so years, captures have been worth it as a general thing, whether they've actually, the lost productivity, the annoyance uh, that uh, they generated is worth the price, uh, to the gain that we have, that is the prevention of some nefarious activities. It would probably be difficult to, to conduct such a study, but I would love if there was one. Um, okay, so our goals here are not really to eliminate captures, uh, but minimize the number of captures shown to legitimate users. Right? We want to we want to lower the burden, significantly lower the burden uh, on legitimate users without giving uh, potential attackers kind of advantage, any kind of advantage. Right? Um, and so the idea is is very simple. Uh, and basically, after the next couple of slides, you can just you you get you'll get ninety percent of it uh, without any technical details. The legitimate user wants to say. Um, that when he's trying to access a website to perform some action, he wants to say, I haven't performed this action uh, recently, right? That I'm not a frequent performer of this action. I don't create accounts every day. I, or last time I did it, it was like a month ago. And the website wants to know, wants, to, wants the user to prove it. Right? If the user can prove that this is an action that he or she hasn't done frequently, then the website might let uh, the user in. And so a legitimate user would present a proof. Okay, and so uh, that's the idea here. And uh, how would this uh, sort of idea be realized? Well, in general terms, it would be some of a capture avoidance protocol, not complete avoidance, but sort of minimization of captures. Instead of presenting the user with a capture, the, the, what would happen is this a server, the web server, would provide uh, the user with a sort of a rate threshold that says, look, uh, if you uh, have you done this more than five times in the last week, and here's the current timestamp, right? So it says last week is the, the, the denotes a period, and it says here's a timestamp of right now when you're trying to do something, and the client would then respond with the proof that in fact uh, it hasn't performed this action more than five times, okay? And the the current timestamp is now added to its database, and it knows what. Uh, uh, that this action and it sort of recorded the current action. Okay? Um, so this is in general terms, right? but uh, of course I haven't told you the whole story. Uh, and of course the client would have to maintain a kind of a per website, right? So it has, let's say the website is something like NewYorkTimes.com, and um, the website uh, the client would maintain a per website list of timestamps, each timestamps corresponding to. Um, its uh, access or its, its, its performance of a certain action on that website. And it would also perform, uh, contain, maintain a global list of so all such websites that uh, uh, would normally present captures, but instead they're using this technique, right? That use these kind of rate proofs. And uh, there will be some kind of a database of these lists and there will be a global list linking them together and the list ownership and its structure would be protected and in, uh, via cryptographic means, uh, in other words, uh, digital signatures. And so we'll get into a little more detail later. Clients that, that this is strictly optional, clients that do not want to uh, or cannot for some reason provide a, a rate proof uh, would simply fall back to being presented with captures, right? So they just, they can still fall back to captures and, and uh, business as usual, okay? So this is not uh, in any way mandatory. Okay, so 
Ideally, the requirements would be like this. We would want clients uh, to have some security, or servers to have some security against uh, malicious clients. Your clients should not forge or uh, modify rate proofs. And the big how here is coming up. There should be privacy for the client. Uh, in other words, a, the web server or a colluding group of web servers should not be able to link um, rate proofs, multiple rate proofs to the client that generated or link two separate uh, rate proofs to the same client. Um, so we definitely want privacy for the client. And we also have, well, sensibly, we want to uh, have reasonable deployability, or right? it should be something that could be deployed incrementally and uh, without um, any interfering with other websites or with use of captures in the wild. Um, it also employ, implies that we want to minimize user perceived burden, right? And so user perceived is what the client user is experiencing. Right now, the client is presented with captures. He has to stare at them, uh, determine the solution, uh, type it in or somehow input it, and then wait for the decision. Uh, we want it to be faster than that, of course. And we also want to minimize the bandwidth between client and server. Especially it says server to client less so, but client to server because the upload speeds are typically lower. So uh, in all this, uh, we are going to use as a giant crutch or uh, something to lean on. We're going to use a trusted execution environment notion, uh, which is um, something that you probably already many of you know about, and some of you are already carrying those things around in your smartphones and your uh, IoT devices, laptops, etc. Uh, the prominent examples of these things are, well, uh, Trusted Platform Module, the TPM, uh, Intel Secure Guard Extension, SSGX, and then ARM Trust Zone. There are probably a few others that are less known, but these three are probably the most popular. What is uh, some, what some of them do, or others may not do it uh, overtly, but there is some notion usually of isolated execution in all of these uh, trusted execution environments. And they are all somehow involved hardware support, right? So they all have some notion of um, dedicated hardware components. And what they allow is the isolated execution of some security sensitive code that is, uh, well, firewalled. And I, here I mean really firewalled from other software on the same platform, right? So isolation means uh, non-interference with other whatever other code may may be running uh, on the device on the same platform so again a like a sgx which is a very popular platform today uses the notion of an enclave and that's a small piece of code that is run within uh, protected by sgx and it cannot uh, sort of have any interfere or no other code can have interference with it uh, typically, a TE would also offer, in addition to isolated execution, will offer some persistent secure storage. Um, you can have integrity protection, encryption, and rollback protection so that resetting or rolling back is not possible. And this is typically done via some kind of ceiling and uh, what's called hardware based monotonic counters. That is, monotonic meaning they only count up uh, and short of like a surgical hardware physical attack, uh, they cannot be rolled back. Uh, and then all of these types of uh, TEs also um, rely on the notion of remote attestation and have this sort of a function that they perform. Uh, um, it's basically an ability to prove to some remote or even local entity that uh, specifically what that what code is running within a this TE and also within a genuine TE. So that uh, if somebody mocks up a fake uh, trust zone, they cannot prove that they're running this code within a genuine trust zone T or within a genuine SJX T. So the notion of remote station is very, very important uh, for all T's that I'm aware of. Now, uh, this remote attestation is typically grounded in something called group signature schemes, which is a cryptographic notion going, dating back to 1991 due to uh, David Chow. Um, essentially, it's a kind of a digital signature scheme, uh, but it doesn't operate like a normal scheme where there's one uh, private key and one public key. Here, uh, there is one public key, but many, many private keys, or potentially very many private keys, each unique, 
each assigned to a different group member. So essentially everybody, every group member has a uh, unique private key, but there is one common umbrella private, uh, public key. And so this makes it very, uh, it's kind of a cute idea. Uh, it's a very useful one where a signature generated by any group member can be verified using the common group public key. It's uh, anonymous, meaning that uh, if you see a valid signature, you cannot tell who generated it. Uh, it is also difficult, sort of, you cannot, when I say cannot, I mean computationally difficult. It's also computationally difficult to decide um, whether two signatures are generated from the same signer. Now, the, these first two uh, properties are not uh, are easily achievable without group signatures. But um, there is another interesting thing here is that there's an openability. Uh, I know it's not really a word, but in case of a dispute, a right, signature is being disputed, a special entity called a group manager can open a group signature and actually determine this the, the member who signed it. And uh, there are also other more um, abstruse um, uh, properties that a group signature, practical group signature might have like revocation because uh, in case there is a dispute and uh, some group member is found to be untrustworthy, there should be a neat, uh, way to revoke them. Anyhow, uh, so one uh, popular group signature scheme is called EPID and it's used in uh, a variant of which is used in Intel SGX. Um, essentially, it's for something called the direct anonymous attestation. Um, which is exactly what remote attestation from the previous slide performs. Okay, so moving right along. So here is basically how uh, capture, or, well, cacti and capture avoidance work using TEs. Here um, we have a server, sorry for the slightly uh, microscopic type here. I hope it can be um, viewed. So here we have a server clients and a T. So this T and the client are in the same uh, hardware platform. Okay, so these two arrows over here are uh, essentially on the same device. Uh, and then, they, of course, client to server remote. Uh, so the client goes to the server, says, here, uh, here's a HTTP GET. I want to get this uh, example.com. And the server says, no, 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 no. This is uh, rate proof protected or normally would be capture protected. So instead of a capture, he shows, he sends this uh, message back, which has um, the um, current timestamp, the starting timestamp, uh, the number of uh, oh, kind of the rate essentially, which is K, which is how many uh, timestamps since, since TS, which is starting time, can there be? Right. Uh, essentially, he's asking the client says, uh, have you used me more than K times since this time? Right. This is a kind of a, have you used me at, at this rate? And then there's the name of the server, the public key of the server, and the signature of the server. And the signature here is not a group signature, but rather in regular, like a EC elliptic curve DSA, and, uh, whatever TLS signature you want to use, style signature you want to use. Um, that client is received by client who then forwards it to its TE. And the TE is, of course, is, remember, trusted. So uh, it uh, looks up the a database uh, of uh, the client's usage of all websites, extracts the list corresponding to this particular website, checks the rate based on this input, right? and basically answers yes or no, OK? So the rate proof is yes or no, but the, 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 what makes it secure is this group signature here. Right, this side, this kind of a very um, complicated looking thing that says sign GSKTE, but basically it's a group signature using this uh, the secret key of the TE uh, vouching for this rate proof. Okay, and then the client uh, forwards this to the server and the server verifies it. And this is essentially a verification of remote attestation, right? Uh, and the, if everything is okay, then it says here, here's your. Um, HTML, uh, whatever you requested. Right? So there's no capture and presented to the user. Okay, so just remember that, of course, we're using two different signature schemes. The TE uses a group signature scheme and the uh, server uses a normal signature scheme. All right, so I already mentioned most of this. All right, threshold count. 
So I kind of went ahead of myself. Okay. So this is not rocket science. It's pretty simple stuff, um, at least on surface. Now, of course, the devil devil's in the details, and uh, implementing all this uh, has uh, give, you know presented a number of challenges that we eventually overcame. But uh, there are some sort of conceptual challenges. How, verifying the attestation of T, right? This is the group signature that the T produces is fairly complicated. There are um, diverse protocols from all kinds of TE vendors, right? So Intel, ARM, VM, I mean, I don't know what else, uh, um, AMD, I mean, they all have different approaches to TEs. Um, different TEs have different versions of software. So some may be older versions, newer versions. Uh, some of them require uh, what's called assistance, right? So some of the, 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 the vanilla, for example, version of uh, uh, remote attestation in Intel SGX actually requires online access to uh, Intel attestation service, right? So in this case, a IAS, Intel, sorry, it's an online real-time access to that uh, service. If you don't have internet access or if there's some bad congestion on the internet, uh, this uh, kind of falls on its face. Um, so our approach to sort of to mitigate this challenge is to use uh, what we call separate provisioning authorities, cacti provisioning authorities that our sole purpose is to, uh, like CAs, uh, certification authorities, um, they would verify remote attestation from clients and issue uh, group uh, private keys. And so this is a, essentially we're punting uh, this uh, problem of relying on, uh, on dealing with heterogeneous uh, remote attestation techniques and different versions, we're punting it into this notion of uh, provisioning authorities. Now, um, the webs the websites themselves can always decide which provisioning authorities they can trust and it, yes this is a new concept a new entity and uh, introducing them is not of course uh, something that can happen overnight but in order to make this uh, approach this general approach of uh, um, cacti based attestation um, we need those authorities right because eventually the server needs to verify uh, the rate proof, right? And so to using provisioning authorities makes this uh, a lot simpler. Uh, another challenge is that the TEs, um, as uh, you can imagine, they have, they're, they're, they're essentially a TE is like, a, is like an alien inside the body of a laptop or, or a smartphone. It's like, a, and when I say an alien, it's, it's, it's got its little, it's got a little brain. It's like a computer within a computer on its own, uh, but it's a smaller one, of course. And uh, because uh, some of them have even implement uh, certain temper resistance measures, etc., and they're expensive, and so they, there's a pressure to keep their uh, footprint uh, small. And clearly, they have uh, limitations on all kinds of resources, including memory. So, like in Intel SGX, uh, an Enclave has at most 100 megabytes of memory. And so uh, storage, so uh, we cannot just allow it to be over, uh, overrun by uh, all these timestamps and lists that we are storing, basically, essentially corresponding to users' activity. Um, so instead, what we do is um, we use the typical uh, uh, kind of a Swiss Army knife or, or the Phillips screwdriver of security, which is hash chains and Merkle hash trees to minimize storage. So here we just store essentially the heads of the uh, of the hash chains um, in in the secure storage, but the rest is stored outside. Um, we also use it if we have multiple lists, right? And of course, any website would. Uh, we only store the heads of the hash chains uh, as um, leaves. We store sorry, we store the heads of the ch hash chains as leaves of a Merkle hash tree, then compute the root of the hash tree, and that itself is the only thing that's stored on board the T. Now I know I'm probably soon running out of time, so I'm going to try to I'm going to try to speed up here. Uh, so this is just the details of producing a rate proof. So I can probably skip uh, skip most of this. There's some um, client. What there, this just describes what client supplies to the TE when it wants a rate proof proof to be produced and what TE performs as a result of a request. It has to verify some correctness of the inputs fetch and database from insecure storage from out, outside the TE 
and make sure it corresponds to the um, root of the Merkel hash tree that it's stored on board the G uh, and produce a rate proof. Um, we can also prune these lists because, of course, you don't want to keep timestamps for user activity that has transpired years ago or many, many months ago. But because of the periods that, of activity that websites are usually interested in is quite recent, so we can prune lists and make storage manageable. Uh, this is just a, a general like architecture. Uh, the in, in this case, we are using Intel SGX. Of course, the concept is equally applicable to the other um, popular uh, TE platform, which is ARM Trust Zone, uh, with a few more challenges, of course. Uh, but yeah, we use SQLite as SQLite uh, as our database management software here, and to which Intel the the enclave inside Intel SGX um, interfaces and. Uh, for the browser on the client side, we require a Cacti extension that has a background script and a content scripted interface. Uh, well, I'm going to just speed up even further. Uh, there is security evaluation. I can say a few words here that uh, we essentially protect. The TE itself offers a lot of uh, protection, in particular, any kind of data integrity and rollback atta uh, attacks are mitigated by fundamental properties of the TE. And a few other attacks uh, we can also deal with either via rate limit by provisioning authority or um, other sort of checks within an enclave. Uh, we cannot mitigate side channel attacks. They have nothing, they're sort of orthogonal to, to our work, but we are relying on other smarter people to deal with those. And uh, last time, so last, last line here that I want to mention is that, of course, the whole notion of cacti or this sort of rate, rate proofs uh, can be easily subverted if the attacker is rich enough to buy SGX farms. If the attacker, like uh, we do with uh, people do with uh, Bitcoin or whatever, uh, other cryptocurrency mining farms, that you buy a lot of hardware, and if each piece of hardware has an SGX, well, then uh, there's no way to tie uh, multiple SGXs together and agglomerate them uh, or force the attacker to agglomerate them. Right? So, the attacker who is rich enough to buy a thousand SGX boxes can still uh, mount certain kinds of attacks, but each, each box, each piece of hardware would be rate limited. Um, so uh, there are a few other things, let's see. Uh, then I'm gonna, I guess, uh, I'll ask uh, Sanjay here, am I uh, running out of time here? Uh, you're muted. Um, I think we need to leave a bit of time for Q&A. We just have 10 minutes. So if we can wrap up quickly, that would be okay. nice. Okay, all right. No worries. Um, so I'll, then I'll just uh, quickly glance over performance evaluation here that uh, uh, we ran it on a fairly, we, we implemented and experimented with uh, with this concept with, uh, like with Cacti on a fairly low end SGX platform. Um, I forget now exactly the specs, I, I used to have a slide, but I don't see it now. Uh, we measured latency of like uh, initial, initializing an enclave when um, the, before the call is made, we need to, uh, well, I'm just gonna skip this and leave. I hope some of the questions will concern us. But uh, suffice it to say that most of the latency that we experience on the client side is due to cryptographic operations. So, for example, uh, you know, in particular, the generation of a group signature on the T is a major contributor to the overhead. And that's something that is incurred every time uh, you need any kind of remote attestation. Right? And basically, what is the remote attestation here? Just to preclude or maybe pre-answer a potential question, what are we attesting here? We are testing not just the rate proof, right? Not the fact, not just the fact that uh, a particular hardware platform has not used a specific website more than k times but we also uh, attesting the fact that this hardware platform is genuine like it's intel sgx and it's running our approved software what is so that the enclave itself the code inside it, the enclave is the code that is expected to be run there the cacti the cacti enclave code right so if somebody tries to manipulate it or put a different enclave that it will not attest uh, we believe that deploying Cacti uh, is not difficult. It can be integrated with CDNs and third-party providers uh, like Cloudflare that is already uh, offers that is already offering capture as a service. Uh, there is some incentive for website operators because it essentially improves user experience and makes the website more attractive, reduces data transfers. 
And uh, the, these uh, provisioning authorities can be the TE vendors themselves or online identity providers like Facebook uh, or Google. Uh, let's see. And uh, just to conclude, so what do we have here? We have um, a kind of a demonstration of a, of a usage of client side in t t trusted execution environments. These are becoming much more popular uh, as, as, as time goes by. Uh, most laptops or many types of laptops, many PDAs, uh, many kind of uh, smart, all, pretty much all smartphones have some kind of a TE. So we might as well take advantage of them and um, kind of combine, uh, combine the usage with reduction of the burden uh, imposed by captures on, on, on regular users. We have provided a proof of concept implementation uh, within limits of modern TE hardware, in particular Intel SJX. Uh, we might have, we, we are exploring possible uh, new use cases for cacti uh, in, or the concept of uh, rate proofs and rate limiting, uh, not just for capture avoidance. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll stop here and just point you to the full paper, which is available at this uh, on the Usenix website. Wonderful. So thank you very much for a very exciting talk and uh, trying to help save us from these annoying captures.